The book was written because there was a story that had to be told, um, and there was a uh, and there was a need for for uh, clarification on an issue that has uh, captivated audiences around the world for the last 65, 70 years. Uh, the book is titled The General Son, Journey of an Israeli in Palestine, and that um, demonstrates or represents the two aspects of the book and the two aspects uh, of the story to which I was witness. So the first part is my being the son of a general and what that means as an Israeli, being the son of an Israeli general. And the second part is the discovery of Palestine and my journey into Palestine, or the journey into Palestine, uh, as an Israeli. Um, and the book touches on uh, all the major hot button, all the, all the major hot button issues that touch on the state of Israel as an entity and also the Israeli-Palestinian issue um, with the two entities, Israelis and Palestinians, together. Um, these issues are Zionism, the justification for Zionism, the justification for the immigration of Jews, um, and my grandparents represent that. My grandparents uh, came to Palestine as, as immigrants, and, um, and the story of that generation. And then the story of my parents, the generation that fought in 1948, that was already born in Palestine, this new, this new Zionist, uh, or the first Zionists that were born in Palestine. And then uh, the War of 1967, uh, the issue of the peace process, the issue of terrorism, and then where do we go from here, the issue of how do we move forward in light of all of that. Um, the reason there's been so much, or there's been a, this much interest in the book and in the story is because it clarifies a lot of issues about which people are still confused. For example, if we in, in the common discourse in the West, the issue of Zionism or Zionism as an ideology has completely come to be accepted, which means that the claim that Jewish people, because they are the descendants of the ancient Hebrews, have a right to go and live in Palestine, and the word that is used is to return. And it's become quite acceptable to say Jewish people have a right to return to their homeland. Even though there's not a single Jewish person alive who can trace their heritage back to the ancient Hebrews, um, who lived there some two, three thousand years ago. Yet, when we talk about the return of Palestinians um, who were forced out of their homes only 65 years ago, many of them are still alive and have the keys to their home, that right to return is denied. And this is very confusing to many people. It's a double standard that people don't understand, and it's hard to explain, how, it's hard to justify. And the only way to justify it is through mythology and double standard, and, um, and this book kind of sheds, sheds, light, uh, sheds light on this issue. Um, and then the War of 1948, at the end of which two things happened. The Jewish state was created, the state of Israel was created, which, again, in the discourse is all is very justified and seen in very heroic light. But on the other hand, you had hundreds of thousands of people who became refugees, close to a million Palestinian refugees. And how do you bridge that? How do you see, on the one hand, this act of so-called heroism and the rebirth of the Jewish people in their own homeland. And on the other hand, you have the story of the refugees. And in many ways, these two stories contradict. People argue over the actual facts. Um, the issue of 1948 is an interesting one. My father was a young officer during those days. And um, again, at growing up as an Israeli, this was an act of heroism. I was very proud of that. However, when we look at the details, when we take a look at what actually took place, if we you know, allow ourselves to go beyond the myth, then we can see that everything that took place is not exactly as we are told. What we are told is, for example, the Arabs attacked the small Jewish community um, in order to destroy them. The Arabs rejected the partition plan, the 1947 partition plan. Uh, and all these things are seen are, as, as just fact and reality. When we look at the partition plan, for example, why would anybody have accepted it? Why should have the Palestinians accepted that their land was cut off and the bigger portion of it given to a small uh, group of immigrants, you know, less than half a million or so immigrants who had just arrived basically in Palestine, while the Palestinian Arab uh, population was far greater. So why should have they accepted it? Then if we talk about the attack, the so-called attack of the Arabs, and we take a look, we see that the Zionist community, the Jewish community at the time, already had a very massive, very strong militia. There was no militia on the Palestinian side 
In fact, there was no Palestinian army. Uh, Arab forces intervened in Palestine much later on, six, seven months later. So you have to wonder if this is true, who attacked the Jewish community? And once again, now historians have confirmed what Palestinians have been saying for almost seven decades, that it was the Zionist militias that initiated a massive attack, a massive terrorist attack, at the end of which almost a million people were forced to leave their home. It was, it was an ethnic cleansing campaign. Um, now this whole story I see from, or I describe from the historical perspective, but also from the story of my parents, my father who fought in, uh, in 1948, my mother who um, lived in Jerusalem and was offered a home, a Palestinian home in Jerusalem after the Palestinian community was forced to leave, uh, homes and neighborhoods in, in West Jerusalem that are still there, uh, and she refused uh, to accept the home, and she told me this story many, many times as I was growing up. I relate in the book, not just because it's a good story, but because there's something very unique, something unique about the story and her point of view. She was a young mother, her husband was fighting in the front, she was offered a beautiful home for free, and she said no. Um, and beyond that, she used to always tell me that this was wrong. You know, she used to say, how could I possibly live in somebody else's home knowing that they're now in exile? Um, and this, of course, contradicted the national narrative, because if the national narrative was true, then what's wrong with taking the home? If the Arabs attacked us, if they left of their own free will, as the narrative, uh, as the narrative claims, then there's nothing wrong with taking the home. So this was, this was the, back, uh, the backdrop for that era. Then we approach 1967, and the War of 1967, once again, the story says that we, um, we, the Israelis, were attacked, we were under an existential threat. Yet my father, who was a general at the time, uh, claimed that the war was a war of choice. As I was working on the book and I went into the Israeli archives, I saw the minutes of the meetings of the generals leading up to the war, and they all talk about an opportunity, not a, um, not a threat particularly when we talk about the Egyptian, uh, the war with, with Egypt, which is how the whole conflict uh, began. So they say the fact that the Egyptian army entered its forces into, or entered forces into the Sinai Peninsula, while it's considered an act of war because it was in violation of the, peace fire agree, uh, the ceasefire agreement, was an opportunity. It made it easier for the Israeli army to destroy them. They were, they were confident of their victory. And um, in fact, they claimed the Egyptian army was not really prepared for war. So you've got the myth and you've got the reality, and Israelis have made no secret of the fact that this was the reality. It's just that after the fact, they began developing this myth of the existential threat. Another thing that comes out is that Israel had always wanted to take the West Bank, particularly the, people, the, particularly the military. They always thought that taking the West Bank was an important part of the mission. Um, and so they did so in 1967, and, uh, and the job was done, and the job was taking Palestine back and giving it, or taking the land of Israel back and giving it to the, uh, to the Jewish people. And in the book, I describe this in very personal terms, things that my father said, things that I'd heard growing up, and then again, using uh, the historical documentation. Um, the next point that, uh, that is, you know, like I said, the, one of these red hot button issues is the issue of the peace process. At the end of the war, my father claimed that it was uh, Israel needed to make peace with the Palestinians and allow them to establish a state in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Uh, this was the late 60s. And during the 70s and 80s, he dedicated himself to that end, meeting with, Pal with PLO representatives, meeting with Yasser Arafat. And the claim was always that the Palestinians don't want peace, the Palestinians are terrorists, um, and Israel, of course, as a state, would have nothing to do with this, even though um, major Palestinian figures had, had uh, invested in putting this plan together, the two-state solution. And then in 1993, you have to wonder what happened. Suddenly, the Oslo Peace Accord came about. And when we take a look at what happened by 1993, why Israel was suddenly willing to meet with the PLO and meet with Yasser Arafat, it's because they had already made certain that there, there could not be a Palestinian state. The West Bank was completely integrated into Israel through building of cities and highways and industry and so forth. It became a part of the state of Israel. There was no chance for a Palestinian state to emerge, which is why Rabin and, and the others were willing to meet with Arafat, but only to get him to surrender, not to really come up with a peace plan. And of course, this is why it fell apart. Um, throughout those years, the 70s and 80s, my father, like I said, um, and, and with several other Israelis, uh, met with Palestinian representatives, met with Yasser Arafat, and they genuinely believed that they could put together a solid peace plan that would allow the Palestinians 
a state and also would guarantee the rights of Palestinian Israelis uh, or Palestinians who are, who are citizens of Israel to equal rights and sadly those both of these things had not happened to this day. Uh, my father passed away in 1995 uh, and his last article was uh, called uh, Requiem to Oslo. He knew full well that the Oslo peace process was going to fall apart. Um, I was not really involved with any of this other than being, you know, being there when people talked about it, growing up with this. And it wasn't until 1997, September of 1997, when my sister's little girl was killed in a suicide attack in Jerusalem. Uh, she was 13 years old, and this is the kind of shock that's hard to describe in words, although I tried in the book to describe it. Um, and after this happened, and people asked uh, my sister particularly about revenge and retaliation, she said, well, no real mother would want to see this happen to any other mother. And in terms of who's responsible, she said, it's the Israeli government that's responsible because these two young men killed themselves or brought to a point where they, kill, they could kill themselves and take the lives of others because of the brutal oppression, the occupation, um, and so forth, and the lack of, of, of hope and possibility when you take away people's homes and you destroy them, when you incarcerate their fathers for very long uh, periods of time in jail, and when you shoot civilians on a regular basis, including children, then this is what happens. Um, so I, I, I was living in the United States already at the time, and I went back trying to figure out how I'm going to approach this. And the chapter that talks about this in the book this is the chapter that begins the journey, and it begins with the lines. Uh, my journey into Palestine began in San Diego. I was 39 years old. So I was in San Diego. That was the first time I ever met with Palestinians. Even though I grew up, I was born and raised in Jerusalem, which is a mixed city. It's a very segregated city, so I never met Palestinians. And Israelis don't meet and interact with Palestinians. And, uh, and so I began, this journey began with, with me participating in a, in a discussion group, a dialogue group in San Diego with Palestinians. Um, and they led me through this very difficult process of realizing that there's another story that is opposed to the story that I know and it's actually, and then to the point where I realized the story that I learned was a myth um, and it was not true and then what was the story that is true. Um, and then I began traveling into the West Bank and I began traveling into Palestinian communities and I realized and I learned that there was this other community, there was this other country, there was other culture and people that were living next door to me the whole time and I had knew nothing about them. And the more I knew, the more I wanted to know. And of course, overcoming the fear and overcoming the mistrust was a big, was a big part of that. Um, and in, in, one, in what one part I described, my first trip, my first, uh, I, the first time I drove into the West Bank, it was to Bilain, the village of Bilain. It was 2005 when the protests, the, the popular resistance began and the weekly protests began. And as I was driving to the West Bank alone, I thought, somebody's going to kill me. You know, I thought for sure that was going to be my last day of earth, on Earth. Certainly it wasn't. I met people in Bilain who are, who are I think, are great heroes. And uh, it was the beginning of a very long and, and, and excellent relationship. Today, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, where do we go from here? And again, the, the, the last chapter of the book discusses these issues. One state, two state, which is an ongoing debate. Um, how, and again, the whole issue of Zionism and so forth. Um, and I think when we take a look at the reality, we take a look at what is going on today, we see that Israel has thousands of political prisoners, Palestinian prisoners, who are held in violation of international law. Uh, today, there's a one particular prisoner who's been on hunger strike for almost 260 days or so, uh, Salman Isawi, and we have to mention him and, 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 and hope and pray that he will survive this ordeal and we won't lose him. He's a great Palestinian hero. But this is a reality that Israeli created. We have laws that discriminate against Palestinians who are Israeli citizens. Um, and they live in an entirely racist and, and discriminatory reality. And then we have the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza who really believe, live under the, or at the mercy of the Israeli military. So how do we move on from here? I think it's important to see that Israel has created one state. Israel has integrated the West Bank completely. So we do have one state, all of, all of Palestine, but it's a Jewish state. And the problem with that is that you can't have a Jewish state when half the population is not Jewish. Because within the boundaries of Palestine, or Israel, depending on how you call it, half the population is, Jew is Israeli, but half the other half is not. We have close to 6 million Palestinians and, a little, and about 6.5 million Israelis, and we know it's going to grow. There will be more Palestinians than Israelis uh, 
in the very near future. Um, so the two-state solution is not going to happen. Uh, there's no Israeli, there's no situation where an Israeli government, a Zionist government, will ever allow that to happen. So the solution has to be found beyond Zionism. The solution has to be found beyond the Zionist uh, paradigm. And that, and, that, and that means a real democracy, a democracy with equal rights, a democracy that affords Israelis and Palestinians the same rights, the same responsibilities, uh, a democracy that allows the release of all Palestinian prisoners, uh, a democracy that allows for the right of return of the refugees, or at least uh, the right of return for those who want to return and compensation for the others. I think it's important to realize many of the homes, original homes are still standing, many of the communities that were um, emptied in 1948 are still standing. The homes are no, are, often the homes are, are restaurants and hotels instead of homes. All that has to be resolved. But the first step would be to allow Palestinians complete equality and complete freedom to get rid of the wall, get rid of the restrictions, get rid of the, of the racist laws, and allow a real election where all Israelis and Palestinians go to the poll and decide as equals. I would argue that because of the similarity of the two societies, um, high education levels, even in the, in the Gaza Strip, with all the restrictions and all the difficulties, education and literacy levels are, are over 90%, some of the highest in the world, um, that the engineers and the doctors and the teachers and so forth who are now living under siege would be able to go to work and contribute. Um, Israel, for example, has a shortage of doctors. There are plenty of doctors, uh, Palestinian doctors, who can do the work, and there are plenty of Palestinian doctors who are already working in, in Israeli hospitals. Um, one example I like to give, it's not in the book, but it's, it's, it's kind of the, the ongoing story, the ongoing journey. Uh, my mother had surgery. She's 86 years old. She still lives in Jerusalem. She just had surgery a few months recently, and the doctor was a Palestinian. Uh, and this same wonderful young doctor who took such good care of her at Hadassah Hospital um, will have trouble when he wants to fly out of Tel Aviv Airport, for example, because Tel Aviv Airport is a very racist place where Palestinians are taken off to the side. All of their belongings are examined for hours. They go through body searches and strip searches and all kinds of humiliating process uh, only because they're Palestinians, only because they're Arabs. And then at the end, they're led like criminals by the hand by a young uh, security officer to their seat. So that can't, that is, it's, all, it's not only wrong and, and, and unjust, but it's also unsustainable. We can't, this reality I think is, is, is completely unsustainable. And it's not only what I think, there are people, there are others who, who feel that way as well. And the opening and the removal, the removal of the barriers and the removal of the barriers between the societies and, the, and, and, and allowing freedom for both Israelis and Palestinians can only help both societies, will enrich both societies. Um, we have a situation where there's an ongoing ethnic cleansing that began 65 years ago. There's an ongoing Nakba, an ongoing catastrophe that began 65 years ago. There are still Palestinian children in, in refugee camps with no heating, with living with no heat, with no running water, with no proper um, nutrition. And this is only happening, it's not somewhere remote. This is not you know, in the mountains of Afghanistan. This is an hour's drive, an hour and a half drive from major cities like Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Children don't get proper health care in Gaza, for example, because there's no, not enough medicine and, and no proper uh, facilities, yet they live an hour, an hour and a half from excellent facilities in, in Be'er Sheva and other places. Um, this, is, this is an ongoing catastrophe that cannot be justified, that has to be remedied. Um, the catastrophe, I think it's important to realize, the Nakba didn't happen and stop in 1948. It's an ongoing process and it's even worse today because it's being allowed to continue. So these children deserve a hope, they deserve a hope, but whether they're in refugee camps in, in, in Lebanon or in Jordan or anywhere else or in Gaza, they deserve um, to be free, they deserve to live as they will, and their families deserve to go back to their homes in Palestine from which they came. And this will solve a lot of the problems, this will solve a lot of the issues uh, that stand there today. Um, we have another issue of an ongoing de-Arabizing of the land, which is happening very rapidly. Palestine, having been a, an Arab country for close to 1500 years, has monuments and names and so on that are all Arabic. But the state of Israel, because it's a racist state, because it's a racist notion, is changing the names and destroying the monuments and creating this mythical connection between the state of Israel and the ancient Hebrews, particularly King David, 
which is particularly ridiculous because there is no historical proof that there was a King David, yet they're trying to create a new history that connects the two, which is of course quite absurd. And again, going back to the discourse, this is how the discourse, people talk about this as though it's natural. Uh, in Silwan, which is a community right outside the old city of Jerusalem, someone decided that the ancient city of David is there and so homes are being destroyed. A, a park is, is, uh, is being built, an archaeological park called the City of David. Tour buses go there and see this. They see the destruction of the homes. They see the fact that Palestinians are, have, have to be removed physically from these homes. They see Israeli settlers taking over other homes in the vicinity, within Silwan. It happens in broad daylight and nobody does a thing. And the fact that all of these things are happening on a regular basis, that we see these things on a regular basis, yet nothing is being done, is very serious. So I would argue that all people who care for peace and justice, all people who care for the state of Israel uh, and for Palestinians, or I should say for Israelis and for Palestinians, uh, need to unify behind a banner of a real equality and a democratic state. Because this is the only thing that will free Palestinians and it will also free Israelis. It will free Israelis from this, this, this racist reality in which they live. Um, and, um, and then uh, start discussing the bigger issues, the issues of land, the issues of water, the issues of compensation, um, and stop the destruction of Palestine, stop the destruction of homes. Like I said, release the prisoners. One thing that often, especially in the West, people don't realize is how important the prisoners issue is. It's said that Palestinians are some of the most incarcerated people in the world. Why is this, how is this justified? How is it justified that almost every family in Palestine has loved ones who are political prisoners, who, by the way, most of whom have not been charged with acts of violence? So these are political prisoners. Um, and again, all of this can and should be resolved, uh, but it's important that we all unite, all people who care about this issue. And again, they don't have to be Palestinians, they don't have to be Jews or Israelis, they just need to be people who care about peace and about justice and work to create this transformation from the racist state that exists there today, the Zionist state of Israel, into a democracy. And there shouldn't be any fear in saying this, although the claim of anti-Semitism always comes up when someone said this, but has nothing to do with liking or disliking Jews. Many Jews support this idea. Many Jews were not Zionists um, way from the very beginning, and many Jews are not Zionists today. Um, and besides, it's the right thing to do. Uh, if we support the State of Israel, if anybody does support the State of Israel, they need to understand that they're supporting a state that has thousands of political prisoners. It's a state that is constantly bombing Gaza and other places, knowing full well they're killing civilians. It's a state that has racist laws and does not afford freedom to its own citizens because they are Palestinians, because they are not Jews. Um, and, and so this is a package deal. That's what supporting Israel means. On the other hand, there's another option and if your values tell you that equal rights and respect for civil rights and human rights is important, then the other option is the right option, and that is the option of real democracy, a democracy that protects the human rights and the civil rights uh, of all people that live there, that guarantees a democracy, that guarantees the rights of whoever the minority might be, because it's, it is a binational state. Hopefully it will become a dem democratic binational state as opposed to what it is today, which is a, an apartheid and a racist binational state. Um, and one side will obviously inevitably become the minority, but their rights should be protected uh, under the law. And there's no reason if, uh, if, if the wall came down tomorrow and this equality began tomorrow, that Israeli and Palestinian societies uh, wouldn't become uh, or form a productive democracy uh, uh, that would move forward and, and, and again act and, and bring about the, the, tr the real potential, materialize, bring the, the materialization of the real potential of Israelis and Palestinians and the real potential of this country which has a great deal to offer, uh, both historically and in terms of, its, of, 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 um, of the people and the makeup of the people and the beauty of the country. So I'm, I have to say I, I'm very optimistic because I think this is a re realistic proposition. It's inevitable. It's the right thing to do. And um, there's no question in my mind that just like apartheid fell in South Africa and non-democratic regimes fell in other places around the world, uh, this will take place in Palestine too and the current regime will fall and it's in its place. There will be a real democracy for Israelis and Palestinians.